Assalamu alaikum and greetings to everyone. Welcome to Mark for our program, Conversations with Authors. My name is Shabir Jaffa, and I'm one of the directors here. Every month, we invite an author or an academic from the Muslim community to join us to talk about their work and answer some questions. Let me begin this session by telling you a little bit about Mark. The Mullah Asghar Memorial Library and Islamic Resource Center, or Mark for short, is named after the late Mullah Asghar Ali M.M. Jaffa, who was a scholar and a beacon of the Koja Shia Ethnashi community. At Mark, we have three key strands of work. The first is knowledge navigation. Mark works to make Islamic knowledge accessible by maintaining an Islamic library that is available seven days a week, having seminar space available for Islamic classes and discussion groups, hosting various children's programs, producing exhibitions that promote Islamic learning and providing links to resources for further Islamic studies on its website. The second strand of work is heritage. Mark works to preserve and promote learning about the heritage of the Koja Shia Ethnashi community through the collection and preservation of heritage texts, hosting a permanent wing dedicated to Koja history, as well as short-term exhibitions highlighting aspects of Koja heritage and producing and publishing literary and multimedia materials about Koja history. The third strand is interfaith work. Mark works to improve relations between people of different faiths by hosting interfaith events, opening its doors to visiting school groups and scholars and others who would like to learn more about Islam and the Shia faith, and creating exhibitions and multimedia that encourage learning about different religions and promote interfaith dialogue. If you'd like to know more about us and what we do, please visit our website at markresource.org. That's markresource.org. You can also sign up there to receive news of our future events and access videos of past ones. For example, uh, my previous conversations with other authors are all uh, recorded and all, all listed there. Uh, and you can, you can access those by, by tapping the little uh, button called Mark TV. So now, Let's meet today's author. It's my distinct pleasure and honor to welcome Sayyid Muhammad Rizvi of Toronto, Canada. Hujjatul Islam wal Muslimin Sayyid Muhammad Rizvi was born in 1957 in a family of ulama, religious scholars in Bihar, India. He comes from a region there called Siwan district, previously known as Saran, and that has produced well-known Shia scholars in the Indian subcontinent. In 1969, he migrated to Africa with his parents, where he received elementary education in an English medium school. He then studied Arabic and Farsi for two years with his respected father and two other alims in Dar es Salaam, Tanzania. In 1972, at the age of 15, he went to the Hausa e Ilmiya e Qum, Iran. Uh, during his 10 year stay in Qum, he studied under various teachers and moved from the levels of muqaddimat to sutu, equal to the graduate level in secular universities. And finally, he attended the Darsai Karij, Ijtihad lectures equal to postgraduate studies in the West of Ayatullah al Uzma Sheikh Wahid Khurasani. In 1982, he returned to India, where he lived in Gopalpur for about a year. Then, in June 1983, at the invitation of the Shia Muslim community of British Columbia, he and his wife and family moved to Vancouver, where he stayed until June 1991 and served Shia Islam through his lectures, writings, and teachings. Based on his publications and educational background, in September 1987, Sayyid Muhammad Rizvi uh, was admitted to the Simon Fraser University of Vancouver. They admitted him to their postgraduate program at master's level. This was despite the fact that he had no formal degree, nor was he asked to sit for any exams. In 1990, he completed his thesis and after successfully defending it, was awarded the Master of Arts degree in history in 1991. 
in July 1991, he moved to Toronto and until 1996 worked as the director of Islamic education at the Information Center, uh, providing a variety of religious services to Shias in North America. During this time, he was also involved in the founding of the Asadic Islamic School in Vaughan, Ontario. Since July 1996, Sayyid Muhammad Rizvi has been the Imam e Juma and resident alim of the Jafri Islamic Center, and now that now the Jafri Community Center. He is also the Secretary General of the Council of Shia Scholars of North America. Sayyid Muhammad Rizvi is the author of 21 books, three translated books, and several articles and pamphlets. His latest book, The Shining Star. Uh, published in 2021, is a biography of his late father, the renowned scholar and missionary, Sayyid Saeed Akhtar Rizvi, and it, it will be the focus of today's conversation. Molana Saab, Assalamu alaikum, welcome to Conversations with Authors, and thanks for joining us. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah to you and all the viewers there. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here to talk about this book. Thank you. Very much. Let me get straight into the questions. In fact, actually, I'll, I'll do a, um, a quick uh, a summary beforehand. Um, the book, as I mentioned earlier, um, is a biography of uh, Molana Saab's late, uh, late father. Um, it's called The Shining Star. And the way it is structured is um, several chapters that are designed in chronological order, which starts with Molana's, with the uh, uh, Alama Rizvi's early years in India uh, and what he did there, his education, um, and then his move to Africa, and then beyond that, his work in the West, uh, finally leading to his, his demise uh, in 2002. Uh, each chapter is related to the, the, the main theme of the book, the title, The Shining Star. Um, it's a truly fascinating book. I, uh, I enjoyed reading it very much. I learned a lot. I didn't know too much about uh, Alama Rizvi beforehand. I grew up in Uganda and he was mainly in Tanzania. Um, and, you know, I'd heard of him by reputation, but this book certainly gave me um, the, the, the knowledge that I needed to understand just what a tremendous contribution this scholar made to the cause of Shia Islam and his service to the Koja Shia Itanashi community. And I encourage every one of you to pick up a copy and read it. It can be ordered for, uh, for free uh, from uh, Ma'arif Publications. You can download uh, uh, a PDF copy if you prefer, um, just to read it uh, digitally, or they will send you a hard copy if, you, if you'd like that. Um, but uh, tremendous read, and I look forward to hearing more from, from you, our listeners, uh, about the book, if you've read it, and indeed, if you have any questions um, about it, you can you can ask uh, Molana Rizvi himself. So, Molana Sab, let's get into the questions. Your yeah. late father had a long and active life serving Islam. Mashallah. Tell us about your decision to write his biography. Uh, who or what motivated you to undertake it, and how did the fact that he had started the process before he passed away? assist you in this endeavor? Well, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. I think if you uh, study the uh, history of Shia uh, world, you will see this uh, tradition of writing uh, biographies of uh, scholars have been a very long tradition in our faith. There are actually uh, specialized uh, works on this multi-volume encyclopedia uh, dealing with the works of the ulama. Many of them, of course, are best on the autobiography or the biographies written about them later on. So that, that idea, or sometimes even you have, you know, uh, extensive work on bibliography of Shia works, you know, Shia scholars who have, uh, produce, uh, you know, in different fields of our faith. And so this is an ongoing tradition of our, you know, broader Shia uh, community. Mm -hmm. And of course, uh, specific uh, 
biographies of the scholars uh, have been in, again part of the tradition. And uh, for example, one of my ancestors from my grandmother's side, um, yeah. also in one of his book uh, at the end, um, you know, writes few pages about his own father. And so that has been there. And uh, my father himself, you know, was um, interested in, in this from very beginning. And um, so the idea that we come up with his biography, you know, um, I was thinking maybe it will be an autobiography where he will write it himself. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, even one of his students, um, he, he used to have some weekly session at, as, um, at his home in Dar es Salaam in the last you know, years of his life yeah. uh, with the medical students and the doctors. Right. And one of them um, actually proposed that, why don't you um, at least dic dictate whatever you think about it and we can have the audio cassettes and we can put it together later on. Mm -hmm. He started that process, uh, although it was not complete, but that was also one of the important resources that I was able to use in uh, working on his uh, biography. So mm -hmm. it, it was a process that he himself was interested in, and that basically um, added the burden on me that I, I had to do something. Right. Uh, it took me some, you know, uh, more than a decade to do that. But uh, Alhamdulillah, I had been gathering the material whenever I went to Dar es Salaam or India. Yeah. Uh, whatever I will see in the files or the documents, I will all bring it here to Toronto. So I've been compiling all the, uh, you know, uh, resources here. And I think, um, you know, COVID-19 became in a way a blessing, <laughs> you know. Right, gave you uh, the time. Where mm -hmm. I thought maybe this is the time. Uh, yeah. And so I spent about three months work on, working on this kind of exclusively, sometimes a whole night, you know, yeah. till Fajr time. Um, and uh, of course, my wife has been a strong support, you know, making sure I'm awake, <laughs> uh, coffee or yeah. chai. So, you know, uh, yes. Uh, so Alhamdulillah, you know, at the end, uh, you know, I, I thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for this opportunity that I was able to do that. Um, yeah, yeah. And I didn't leave it for others or, you know, the future generations to work on it. Yeah. yeah. Well, you do have a few other responsibilities in your life, Molana Saab. So I think you can be forgiven for taking 10 years to do it. <laughs> but anyway, congratulations for doing that, completing it. Uh, as I said, it was a, a very enjoyable and, and uh, enlightening read. Um, let's turn to my second question. Um, you write that Sayyid, Sayyid, Sayyid Akhtar Rizvi, whom I'll refer henceforth to as Alama Rizvi, was yes. the fifth, the fifth in the consequent generations of religious scholars of his family, which makes you, Maulana Saab, the sixth. Is this typical of many ulama families uh, or is yours an exception in this, in this particular regard? It's a difficult question to answer in that way. I would say yes and no. Uh -huh. there are many examples I have seen in history of the uh, scholars where the line continues, might not be continuous. Yes. You know, maybe the grandchildren, you will continue later on or something like that. There mm -hmm. are gaps in between. Uh, but no, it's, it's not necessarily a norm. Uh, but you will also see, you know, um, the continuity also in certain, like in my own fa family, yeah. Uh, if you see, it's it's more we trace the line of the scholars from my grandmother's family up. Uh huh. Okay. So you have my grandfather and my father, and yeah. then you have my grandmother's father, uh huh, and his father, uh, and and you know his father-in-law, yeah, going on. So that's how we get to the uh, sixth generation here. Right. In, in that way. So it's yeah. not necessarily uh, a direct line all the time. No. Yeah. It's even uh, some from the uh, scholars in the earlier generations, uh, their children have not continued in the same line. No. no. Well, may Allah bless them all for their service to our faith. Inshallah. Um, 
when uh, Alama Rizvi was eight years old, he moved to Patna, uh, where amongst other subjects, he was taught English and math. Uh, you write that in those days, it was unheard of for seminary students to study English. Why was that? Um, it, because it certainly proved to be useful for him to know English uh, after he moved to Africa, didn't it? Yeah, I, I think we had to understand the uh, cultural history of uh, Muslims in, in Indian subcontinent. Yeah. You know, for a long time, because of the uh, influence of the Mughal Empire and, um, you know, the language itself, Farsi it was a beautiful language. It is a beautiful language. So among Muslims, Shia and Sunni alike, Farsi yeah. was the academic language. Uh-huh. And of course, if you want to study Islamic studies, then Arabic would be a must. And so in the curriculum of the, uh, you know, seminaries, whether Shia or Sunni, um, it would be more, you know, studying Urdu and Farsi and Arabic. Right. English was still considered, um, you know, this is a, a foreign language, you know, uh, not relevant to us. And so it was not really encouraged, uh, right. I would say. And I don't know what was the thought of my grandfather. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless him for this. Mm -hmm. you know, because he planted the, uh, the ground for my father to work. Right. He actually uh, had a, pri a private tutor to come and teach him English. Oh. Um, mm -hmm. You know, and maths also separately. Yeah. Uh, but this was done not in a school. This was done as, as a, you know, uh, private um, uh, tuition. Uh, I, I don't know. My father never mentioned about it, but why my grandfather thought in that way? He didn't mm. know English himself, but yeah. um, this was kind of an inspiration in, in a way which prepared him for the future. Right. Well, he clearly had the foresight uh, and, 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 and knew something that, that the rest of us didn't. Uh, yeah. that it proved to be so useful. So well done. Um, would you say that the episode which best illustrates uh, Alama's early quest for tablig was during his time in Halor, Bihar state in 1948, when through the effectiveness of one of his Friday kutbas, he brought about the conversion of a Hindu <laughs> untouchable couple? I would like to actually connect that with the with the idea which came first in his mind when he was only 14 years old, when he went yeah. to the, for the summer vacation to his uh, uh, grandfather, you know, his Nana's uh, home in mm -hmm. uh, Bhagalpur, uh, who was actually an alim as well as a tabib, you know, the doctor, um, you know, who uh, this was the traditional, you know, medicinal uh, path. Yeah. And so he was a man of, uh, you know, uh, letters and had a good library. And what really interested him was reports of one of the uh, monthly magazine from Lucknow, Madras mm -hmm. Wazin, which was a Madrasa, Shia Madrasa dedicated for training missionaries. And they would actually send them to different parts of uh, you know, United India those days, as well as foreign countries, as well as, you know, East Africa. Right. Uh, and, and Burma um, uh, and Singapore. So these missionaries uh, basically would send their reports. And that is how the first time my father basically, um, you know, kind of visualized himself being in Africa you know, by looking at the reports in jungle yeah. with, you know, wild animals going around. Yeah. And so that, that is something which, which actually triggered him and inspired him. But on the scene of India itself, yes, the first uh, tablir or conversion process was in Halor, which is actually not in Bihar, it is in UP, the okay. Okay. Uh, uh, neighboring state. And he was the resident alim after my grandfather there for some time. I see. Yeah. Um, and there he was actually able to convert a, you know, Chamar couple. And these are the untouchable ones among the Hindus, very, yeah. you know, lower caste. Right. And uh, that Friday khutbah was basically more to, um, you know, he did something which was not, 
uh, normal, you know, because Chamar were even kind of shunned by Muslims also. And he mm -hmm. actually asked him to go bring a, a, a glass of water. And he mm -hmm. drank that on the member just to show that now he is a Muslim now. Yeah. And so, uh, you know, you have to respect him, uh, you know, in the same manner. And so, yes, that, that was the, the beginning of the process. Uh, I see. Conversion. Yeah. Uh -huh. Okay. Very interesting uh, anecdote that. Um, okay, th this one's not so much a question, but more for your comments. Um, Alama Rizvi's tenure as the resident alim in Dar Salaam Jamaat began in 1964. Uh, shortly afterwards, he was called upon to provide input on a Tanzanian government initiative regarding marriage and divorce in Islamic law. Um, subsequently, he used the same material uh, for a similar purpose in Kenya. Yeah. Um, you proudly state in your book that when the Shia community needed a voice to represent it in the legal chambers of Kenya and Tanzania, Alama Rizvi provided it. Uh, would, you, would you care to comment on that? Yes, I, I, I think at that time, you see the, the uh, I, I wouldn't say there was no one else, but I would say that the only person known in the community yeah. uh, who would be able to articulate and present the Shia Isnashri pers perspective on marriage, divorce, uh, and inheritance uh, right. in a legal way uh, was him, you know, who could even do that in English. Okay. And, and, and that was the uh, unique uh, thing. And that's why I, I consider that, you know, he was a blessing for the community. Right. Um, and he was able to provide his uh, expertise on this issue. Even one of his close friends, whom I mentioned in the book in, in more than once, uh, Marhum um, Bashir Rahim, mm -hmm. was actually... Um, uh, part of the parliamentary system, you know, uh, drafting the laws and things like that. Yeah. And also uh, Mullah uh, Hussein Rahim from the same family from Zanzibar, who was also yeah. an attorney there. Yeah. And if you look at their remarks, they best, uh, they very highly, you know, uh, appreciate the way he yeah. was able to uh, present the Shia point of view. Yes, they, they were all from lawyers background, so they knew the yeah. Uh, the legal way of presenting things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You you replicated Bashir Bai's comments in, in the book, so yeah, it was, yes. uh, it was uh, yeah. Um, great. Uh, in the in the chapter in the book entitled "The Voyaging Star," you wrote that uh, I quote: "The lack of interest in doing tabligh amongst the indigenous people of East Africa was partly due to the inward focus of the Koja community there." Um, do you think, Maulana Saab, that we're doing better in that respect now, thanks to the efforts of Bilal Muslim Mission? Well, I, I would, uh, you know, um, I was very careful about writing that section. <laughs> yeah. Especially, you know, I uh, let my father speak. You know, there's a whole section there where it's, it's his own words. Yes. Uh, based on the uh, audio recording that I have. Um, because I, I wanted the history to be there. You know, sometimes mm -hmm. we try to uh, kind of brush away, you know, issues which were not very comfortable in the past, but I think it's important to, to, to know the history and yeah. the uh, challenges that we have gone through, uh, especially when we talk about the Koja Shri community in East Africa. And so this was an important issue. I, I think the, the, the background is very important. You know, you, you look at a community which has come from, migrated from India yeah. uh, to East Africa. So now you have kind of three classes there in the society. You have the, the white British as the rulers, and then you have the Africans right at the bottom. Mm. And then you have the Asians in between, more, yeah. mostly as, as merchants. And so that, created kind of a, you know, uh, this uh, sense of, you know, we have nothing to do with them. Mm. And, and this is where I, I'm talking about, you know, more inward focus. Unfortunately, even the ulama who, who came didn't really um, emphasize this issue of tabligh. Some of them did, but it didn't yeah. really have an impact. Uh, and, and so uh, I, I would say, I, I would actually go back to my father's 
uh, words there in this in the following section where he says that I can still remember people who were opposed to Bilal Muslim mission in, mm. in early days, but mm. I see their children and grandchildren fully supporting Bilal Muslim mission. Right. right. So there has been a change. Yes, there, yes. there has been a positive change, and I I think now Bilal Muslim mission and, and the whole process uh, of uh, you know um, sharing our faith with the indigenous indigenous people in Africa it, it is a matter of pride for the community yes uh, which was not there during the early days yeah and so well, we have moved in a uh, i think very positively uh although i wouldn't say we are still at the end <laughs> we still have to uh, yes. struggle and and work especially yeah. with our challenge in in the western countries we have different kinds of you know challenges uh, mm. you know mm. i i uh, let me let me just share my my feeling on this issue. Go ahead, go ahead. Uh, that you know, I I, I have difficulty when I see that you know when we talk about interfaith gatherings and meetings, we very you know uh, wholeheartedly wel welcoming it. And at the same time, then I see when people from the Shia background, from a different you know ethnic background or cultural background, when they come. The kind of a, you know, uneasy uh, feeling among uh, some mm. members of the community, mm. and I think that is that is a problem that we have to tackle. And uh, I, I hope that the next generation would be able to uh, identify itself, let's say, in Canada as a uh, as a Shia Muslim, um, you know, in Canada, yeah. irrespective of their you know um, ethnic or cultural background. Yeah. And I don't mean to say that our culture is not important, the language is not important. No, we 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 actually respect Canada for multiculturalism. Yeah. Why not preserve our language and culture? Yes. But let us have that open heart that when we interact with the Shias from other, you know, ethnic backgrounds, yeah. Um, we should be uh, you know, welcome. Yeah. yeah. Very good observation. Uh, and thanks for expressing it. Yeah. Um, okay, turning to my next question, uh, Alama Rizvi left the position of resident Alim of Darjamat in 1969 in order to dedicate more time for Tabligh through the Bilal Muslim mission. Uh, in your book, you provide a clear timeline and narration to show that the idea and plan for doing Tabligh with Africans was initiated and then presented by him to the officials of Africa Federation. Um, why did you feel it was necessary to make this point? Well, the reason why I, I, I felt that this is necessary for the sake of record in history, uh, because whatever I have read or heard from, from the leaders also sometimes, yeah. when they talk about the uh, Koja history or Shia history of East Africa, or even the uh, you know, formation of Bilal Muslim Mission and the Tabligh Initiative, I, I have sensed that, you know, the, the right, you know, uh, respect, or I should say the credit, which deserve, uh, that my father des deserved in this uh, endure, is not really recognized or given. Okay. And I, I, I felt that because I, for example, and I mentioned that uh, many times, I've seen some human leaders saying that, Oh, this whole Tabrik process started with this fatwa of the late Ayatollah Hakim. Yeah. Ayatollah Hakim's support was um, very important, but we had to re realize that it came at the end of the process. Right. You know, there was a process which was already there and there were uh, very extensive, um, you know, communications mm -hmm. when, I, when my father was in Lindi yeah. with uh, uh, Marhum, um, um, I'm just uh, missing the name at the moment on my tips here. Um, uh, Sharif, uh, Sharif Devji. Sharif Devji, home. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, where, you know, he's the one who went to for Ziyarat later on, and Ayatollah Hakim out of the blue asked him, what, what are you people doing for the Africans? Yeah. And, mm -hmm. and he was really shocked. <laughs> that right. I don't yeah. have an answer there. 
Yeah. Uh, but this is where he is already being approached by my father about this issue. Uh -huh. And <laughs> the early communications was that who will do it? There's right. no alim who knows Swahili. And this is where my father then, you know, uh, makes a note that I didn't respond to that question until I got my result of my Swahili exam. <laughs> uh, and then yeah. I sent it yeah. to him. But I already worked on it. So it's not just, you know, yeah. on I'm talking about. I'm actually also preparing myself for that. Right. And so I think that the, the, the effort and the insistence and even the... Um, the, the resolution which was passed in the uh, triannual conference in 64 in, Ta in Tanga yeah. was based on the write-up which was of my father, translated mm -hmm. by Marhum Rafiq uh, Somji from right. English to uh, Gujarati for see. the delegates. Yeah, yeah. And so mm -hmm. this, this is where I wanted to make sure that, you know, that do credit is given to him uh, for being the one who initiated this. Yes. Uh, and led it to the formation of Bilal's community. Yeah. Yes. One point you mentioned in your response was the ultimate recognition that uh, uh, Alama Rizvi uh, eventually got. And we'll get into that in my next but one question. Uh, but for now, let me turn to Uganda, where I grew up. Um, uh, you quote Alama's own words that our community leaders there refused to let him and his team establish Bilal Mission uh, in the 1960s in Uganda. As a result, when the Asians were expelled from Uganda in 1972, um, there were no African Shias in the interior of Uganda to use all the masjid and imambaras that we had built. Uh, what do you think was the reason for this short-sightedness? I think it was the oral, you know, atmosphere, as I mentioned earlier, you know, yeah. the colonial uh, atmosphere had its own impact on a subconscious level. And uh, I think lack of leaders uh, among the Koja community, um, unlike the situation in Tanzania, you had uh, Rafiq Somni Marhum, mm -hmm. uh, Hussein Walji, uh, these were the people who really strongly supported my father on, on, in this initiative. Mm -hmm. Or in Kenya, you had uh, uh, um, uh, Mulla Muhammad Jafar Sharif Devji, as well as Mulla Asghar Marhum. Yes. Uh, I think there was a lack of such uh, leaders in the Ugandan community uh, mm -hmm. who would have emphasized this point that this is what we should be doing. Right. Okay. Yeah. So it was a leadership issue. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Um, I did enjoy the story of when Mullah Asghar, whom you mentioned just now, and who this institution, Mark, uh, is named after, yeah. when he was the Secretary General of the, of the Supreme Council of African Jamaats. Um, one day, Alama Rizvi took him and some others to visit a school at yeah. uh, Habib Qasim Manji's Saisal Estate in the Rufiji area of Tanzania. And there, for the first time in Shia history, Mullah Asghar heard the children um, in that center reciting in Kiswahili, um, and I quote, Imamu wa kwanza Ali alayhi salam, uh, Imamu wa pili Hassan alayhi salam, and so on and so forth. Yeah. And you describe how on hearing this, Mullah Asghar was overcome with tears of joy, uh, that as a result of the Bilal Muslim mission efforts, tens of thousands of Africans accepted the Shia faith. And there, and there are now many African Shia uh, sheikhs, alims, working as resident alims in East Africa, as well as in the West. So given all that, uh, why do you think that it wasn't until 1976 at the Supreme Council Conference that his tabligh work uh, was formally recognized by the community? I, I, I don't know why <laughs> I wouldn't be the right person to answer that. I think those okay. who they, they took the decision are no more, uh, you know, there. Um, yeah. I think probably, and I'll mention something which I heard from my father. Yeah. Uh, although I didn't, didn't mention uh, in the book, he said that even initially when the uh, officials of the uh, Supreme Council agreed uh, 
for the formation of Bilal Muslim Mission and initial funds which were coming, there was always a hesitation. They were not sure whether this will be fruitful or not. Uh-huh. So I think maybe that that would would have been a, a partial reason for it, just to see yes. you know whether this is going to be a success or a failure. Okay. Uh, before they uh, even think about you know recognizing him or giving him right. this uh, uh, award in that way. Yes. Yes. But by then the the die was cast. I mean, it, it yes, pretty yes. well. I'm not in love. Yeah. By you know, uh, yeah, early seventies things were very well established. Yeah. Yes, indeed, indeed. Um, there were some memorable lines written by Alama Rizvi, uh, which you quote. Uh, these were published in December 1972 in the Light Magazine, mm-hmm. and I quote: "People of other faiths do not know what Islamic books teach." They only see how Muslims behave. And through that observation, they form their views about Islam. If the Muslims behave like true Muslims in all walks of life, there will be no need to appoint any missionaries for the propagation of Islam. The character of Muslims will be enough to attract the whole world towards Islam. These these words were both striking to me as well as wise. Wise words indeed. Uh, it makes one think uh, what Alama would have made of today's world, in which Muslims' affairs seem to be in such disarray, thanks in part, uh, I guess, to the behavior of some Muslims. What do you think he would have? What do you think he would have commented? Well, I, I, I think you know. Um, I would say that there will always be in a segment in the world in different parts of the world who will not like Islam, who will not like Muslims. Mm. But they they get the fodder or the ammunition to use against us from the yes. behavior of the Muslims themselves. Right. You know, bin Laden and company in a very yes. broad sense. Uh, mm. They are the people who basically brought uh, a negative image of Islam to the world, and that is being propagated by those who don't like Islam. So, right. uh, yes, it's it's uh, it's a difficult task, but I think um, I think even in the, in the book, if you look at the story of the conversion of this uh, pagan tribe in Kenya between Mombasa and Nairobi, yes, you will if you look at the story there, and I've given that in detail. Mm-hmm. It was because of the um, honesty and integrity of the uh, Shia Koja merchants from uh, Mombasa who yes. used to go there and interact with them regularly. Right. And that is what actually attracted them. Right. And this is eventually where the chief becomes uh, Shia, and because of his own influence, you know, the whole tribe becomes Muslim and Shia. Mm. That is one example that it was not really missionary activities. It was actually the behavior of the uh, Shia individuals and how Mm -hmm. they interacted with them. You look at the example of Indonesia. No Muslim army has ever, you know, set their, uh, you know, boots there. Mm. Uh, No Mughal, no Arab army, nothing in the past. But today, Indonesia is the largest Muslim country number-wise. This is because of the Muslim merchants from Indian subcontinent and Yemen, yes, uh, who would travel there and for trade. Uh, and of yeah. course, the mm-hmm. the Sufi missionaries also had an impact there. Yes, so it was more the akhlaq of the people, and mm-hmm. that's what we have to learn in the in the West about it. Right, right. Well said. Um, it's around. It's about one forty now, so uh, we want to give our audience or listeners the chance to ask questions. So let's uh, let's. Uh, progress through the rest of my questions as quickly as we can to give them a chance. Um, Alama Rizzi's publications like Islam, God of Islam, Muhammad, the last prophet, Imamat, the vice recent vice regency of the prophet, the family life in Islam and sects of Islam. These were all translated and distributed all over the world. Um, would you agree that as more Muslims emigrated or fled to the West in the 70s and 80s, the knowledge and guidance contained in his books, in these books, they helped to fill a real gap that that people were thirsting for religious knowledge in their own tongues and in English 
and Alama's books basically met that need. W would you agree with that? Yes, indeed. It, uh, it's a true fact that uh, not only those who migrated from the East to, to, to uh, Europe and North America, hmm. but even if you see the, the new converts who came to Islam and Shiaism, yes. many of them you will see their initial introduction to Shia Islam was through his books and his booklets. Okay. Okay. Uh, and so that's that's indeed uh, true. Yes, right. it's much later on that uh, we see uh, after the um, revolution in Iran that you know the issue of propagation in different languages, you know, uh, started in a more broader uh, form. But before that, it was mostly his books and his publications which were common. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then uh, a year before Alama left East Africa to return to India, he translated into English the 13 volumes of Tafsir al-Mizan, which is a most scholarly work on Tafsir by the late Alama Taba Tabai. Um, this was a, a huge project uh, that took up a lot of his time. Uh, and in fact, Alama Rizvi passed away before he could complete the task. Yes. Um, you, Molana Saab, agreed to complete the work which you did in 2015. Um, you then undertook a similar task by finalizing Alama's seminal work, the book entitled A History of the Shia People. That's one I still have to read. <laughs> um, appropriately, you dedicated this book to your late mother. So I have to ask you, Molana Saab, yeah. how, given all your responsibilities, including that of resident Alim of Toronto Jamaat and you know, chairperson of the of the uh, group of Shia scholars in, in, in Ontario, all your other responses, how did you accomplish all this when you had so much on your plate? Well, it's, um, it hasn't, hasn't been an e easy issue for me to work on all these different things, but my yeah. Uh, passion and my interest as far as you know writing and reading and yeah uh, this has been there with me from before whether I'm a resident alim or not doesn't matter yeah uh, but yes with a large community uh, like Toronto Jamaat that we have yeah. things are not that easy and that's why we have been uh, discussing and talking about uh, assistant uh, you know alims Mm -hmm. uh, Alhamdulillah, we now have we have Sheikh Jafar Jafar and Morana Sayyid Sagir in um, yes, Hamilton, yes. and now gradually there are many, you know, um, duties or works that I delegate delegate to them, um, and even the uh, rec reciters of the events, um, basically now uh, dividing among other uh, speakers also. Yes. Uh, so that I can also focus on the interest that I have, especially on my work on the Quran, which is very close to the end, inshallah. We inshallah. Uh, intend to finish that before Ramadan. Yeah. Right. Inshallah. Inshallah. So, but let me just make a comment about uh, Al Mizan is that yeah, he actually uh, was asked uh, to work on it a year yeah. before he left. Africa to go back to India, but the work uh -huh. started when he was in India. Yes, um, and it continued. Now you know when you talk about Al Mizan in Arabic, it's twenty volume. Yes, but each <laughs> Arabic wow. volume becomes two English version. I see. So okay. when you talk about ten volumes, it's just five volume of the or original. Yes, uh, out of the twenty. Yeah. So. Um, when my father passed away, only 12 volumes had been published I see. in English, and 13th was uh, only done one third. So my promise to the, um, the main person you know, who was behind this project, yeah. um, uh, Islam, uh, Sayyid Mursa Zanuri, was that I will at least finish this incomplete volume. Yeah. Um, they, were want, they wanted me to continue the whole process, but I said, I have certain things in, in pipeline. Until that's finished, I cannot come. Yeah, back. right. So mm. we, we, we pray that others, yeah, some others have already taken on the task. Yes. And some volumes have come out. Yeah. Great.
Okay. Um, next one. I, I wonder how many people realize that in 1982, after finishing your studies in Qum, you almost settled in Thailand, but based on an istakhara and your father's good advice, you decide to settle here in Canada. Now, Molana Saab, you, are you telling me that you gave up the wonderful tropical climate of Thailand to come to freezing Canada and serve us hard-headed kojas? <laughs> well, um, the, the, the choice of Thailand actually was the first one. Yes. Uh, because of my familiarity with uh, some of the officials of the community and helping them. My father also helped their first four students who had come to Qom. Ah, and I was okay. kind of friend and a mentor to them. Right, there was and a connection. So when they yeah. found out that I'm, you know, living home now, going back to India, yes, uh, they were very much into this. Then why don't you come and settle down here? Yeah. Uh, but then there was another invitation from uh, San Antonio, Texas, uh -huh. and then one from uh, Vancouver. But my father is, uh, you know, uh, suggestion was that you know uh, San Antonio community was a kind of a mixture of Shia Sufi. Yes, commune type, you know, which unfortunately is no more there. The mm. assets have been sold. Mm. Uh, so he was saying, don't go there. He had been to East, uh, North America a year before. Yes. Uh, so based on Istakhara, you know, we came to Vancouver. Yes. And uh, I don't regret that decision. Alhamdulillah. Oh. Oh. <laughs> We're glad to have you. Thank you for coming to us. Um, in the final chapter of the book, The Setting Star, you write about Alama's demise in 2002, and you tell us in your own very personal way, um, his words of support and encouragement for my various writings and activities, and his own example in life always boosted my morale to move forwards. Tell us briefly about that feeling, if you don't mind. Well, it's... That that void and that you know loss for me is is there still there you know yeah. uh, it cannot be filled by anyone else in that way. Uh, right. I remember mentioning this in the ziyarat majlis in Dar es Salaam for my father, yeah. where I said, "It's not only me who have become orphan; it's my pen also which has become orphan." Right, right. Because mm -hmm. I had somebody whom I could always go back. Yes. Uh, you know, for uh, guidance and support and to see whether things are going yeah. in the right direction or not. And so, okay. uh, of course, he was a father to me. The, so that's another element there. Yes. Uh, so I still I still miss him and uh, feel that yes. loss and void. Yes. Yeah. Well, while we do that, while we consider that thought for a second, then. Let us let us recite Surah Fatiha for him and all our all our mothers and fathers, all Walidain. I also like the story you told of when someone once asked your late father. Uh, why did you send only one of your sons for religious studies? And he replied, one sacrifice for the community is more than enough. <laughs> uh, he clearly had a very mischievous sense of humor, didn't he? Yes, yes. He said, you know, <laughs> <laughs> That's good. Um, well, so if you watched any of our past interviews, you'll know that I always ask my guests at least one lighthearted question. So uh, permit me, here, here goes. In chapter nine, uh, you know, it contains many photos from your family's photo albums. Um, there it is, lots of photos. Um, uh, you obviously removed these, these were hard copy photos and you sent these to your publisher to include in the book. Now, Molana Sab, I do hope that you managed to put them all back and in order before your good lady discovered that they were missing. <laughs> Well, I don't think she will miss that, but she, because she was part of the process anyway. Oh, she was. Okay. <laughs> All right. Good. So, uh, All right. No, that, uh, actually, what we had done was uh, yeah. we went through the albums that we have, and then we have many, many pictures just piled up in different places. Yes. So we had yes. to sort them out, and my 
youngest one, Najia, was assigned the task of scanning them. Yes. Uh, and then after she had scanned it, then I sorted out and to see which are the pictures that we would be using. So it, it was a good exercise to actually put it in a more digital form. Uh, yes. So it's inshallah more lasting. Yes. Um, so yes, but Yes. My wife was part of the process anyway, so I, oh, I would not be blamed for that. So you won't be in trouble there. Okay, no. good. <laughs> um, I remember seeing the one of uh, your son Mahdi climbing on his grandfather's back. I must yeah. have a word with Mahdi about his lack of judgment there. <laughs> um, anyway, last question. Five years ago, on the eve of the Holy Prophet's birth anniversary, uh, we celebrated your 20th anniversary, your 20th year of service to the Toronto Jamaat. Yeah. Do you, you remember how we surprised you that evening? Yes, yes, yeah, yeah. So this means that it is now 25 years that you have completed as our resident alim. Uh, as you look ahead to the next 25 years, inshallah, how do you think our community here and globally are doing, uh, both spiritually and organizationally? Uh, do you think we're adequately prepared for the opportunities and the challenges that we will no doubt encounter in the future? Well, I, I think it's, uh, it has been a good, uh, you know, experience for me. And uh, I think as far as the community is concerned, we have reached a point where now we have settled down. Yes. There's no more issue of, you know, oh, maybe we might go back or anything like that. Yes. Our children don't know any what on but Canada. For them, right. this is their homeland. Um, and of course, I think we are already equipped and ready for taking on more broader, you know, uh, um, objectives. I think uh -huh. one would be uh, the issue of tabligh that we are yes. talking about in this book. Right. We have been till now just working to uh, establish ourselves, make sure our next generation is on the same path. But I think as the stage has come where we are now ready to expand our horizon mm -hmm. and look at different challenges of trying to share our faith with others in, in, in a land like Canada. Yeah. And I think that is doable. Uh, and I think we are now prepared we have, alhamdulillah, now young ulama coming in, many of them who was grown up and studied here in the West. So yeah. uh, the ground is fertile and the, uh, the people who can do this task are also right. uh, gradually coming forward. And inshallah, we look for a bright future. Inshallah. So you would say it's not so much a matter of human resources. We have those and we have other resources. It's now a matter of the will and the willingness to do will that. Will that, and that, that vision of moving forward yeah. in that way. Okay. Broader, you know, horizon there. Yeah. Right. Right. Okay. Let's turn to our listeners now. Uh, I'm seeing a few comments and questions come up. Um, the first one is from Brother Razakara. Uh, Salams, I read the book from cover to cover and found it most engrossing. Um, as a Dar Jamaat official, I did come across the late Alama now and again, and I was in awe of him for the zeal with which he carried out the mission of spreading Shia Madhab in the local African population. We see the results today and the often fears of community members for the Africans to make inroads uh, into our so-called cocoons were misplaced. May, alama, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala elevate Alama's status and give tawfiq to Molana Muhammad Rizvi's uh, to carry on in his father's footsteps. Thank you for that comment, Brother Razakara. From Sheikh, uh, from Dr. Hussein Kimji, in one of my trips to Tanzania um, in the month of Muharram, it was very encouraging to see the progress being made at Bilal Muslim Mission in the terms of tabligh amongst the local, and I think that's where it comes off there amongst the local uh, the population, I think is what he meant to say. Razakara also uh, prompted the name that we were looking for, Marhum Ibrahim Sharif Devji. Yes, uh, we looked Ibrahim. for that yes. earlier on. Uh, Razakara also says, are we lagging behind in tabligh activities vis-a-vis uh, -vis Bilal Muslim mission in East Africa, in North America? 
I think you, uh, I think you addressed that question of, a few minutes ago. Thank you for that. Um, th there's clearly a need for that. Uh, Hussein Bai, my mentions got cut off because of a little glitch in the internet. As I was saying, I was pleasantly surprised at the progress Bilal Muslim Mission has made. I attended the Julus on Ashur Day in Tanzania, and it was heartwarming to see the Bilal Mission decided to proceed through the Wahhabi dominated area. The Julus stopped there, gave a talk on loudspeaker about the tragedy of Karbala. All this uh, and other progress Bilal Mission has made and the many scholars that have produced uh, is the work initiated by Alama. My other question is, what can we do to reach out to the indigenous communities in Canada? Any thoughts on that, Molana sir? I think we have established some uh, initial contacts with the indigenous community here, especially in Georg Georgina Island here, okay. just north of us. Um, our community in Saskatoon also have been in contact with them. Yeah, uh, because they are the numbers are more there in 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 the Saskatchewan uh, province. Um, I think it, it is an important issue, but we we don't need to just focus on them. I think our approach should be to spread the message uh, generally to the indi yes. indigenous and others also. Okay. Uh, we don't need to just target uh, target that one community. I know they are very sensitive issue these days. Um, we can exploit the situation of what happened as far as the Catholic and other churches are concerned as um, vis a vis the residential homes. Those issues yes. can be exploited, but I don't think this is the right way of doing it. Right. And so we have to be a little bit of sensitive about it. We, um, uh, but we should be, uh, you know, establishing links with them uh, and especially to sympathize with the issue that um, their rights have not yet been fulfilled and we should be uh, supportive of them in that struggle. Okay. Thank you for that. Um, I'll ask my AV team, uh, do you see any other questions on our chat that I've missed? Uh, Sabra, can you tell me or have, have I covered all of them? Yes, there is one left. There's one left? Um, yes, last one. I'm just trying to see Especially where that is. Datu. Yes. Okay. Yeah. It's not coming up on my screen. Oh, there it is. Yeah, there we go. Uh, so from Bashir by Datu, what more needs to be done to integrate converts in the West more fully into our community so that they feel welcome and become an integral part of the community? I think this is this this is a lot of to do with uh, our you know mindset. Um, yes, I understand you know when we talk about let's say ISIJ or um, Bashir Bai coming from Orlando, the community, the Jamaat there. Yeah, you know, it's one ethnic group at majority, for example. Yes, but we had to realize that you know we here our migration to this part of the world has put a burden on us of okay. sharing our faith with others. And in order to do that, we have to open up, you know, our minds and hearts um, in order to do things in a way that when a new person comes in, they can relate to it. Yes. And, and this is something which needs a, you know, um, detail discussion and work on it uh, so that they can relate to what we are doing yeah. uh, and be part of the community. Okay. Thank you for that. Yeah. Any other questions from our audience? As I said, you can ask it by the chat function or you can uh, put your hand up, your uh, icon hand up and, and you can ask it orally if you, if you prefer. Um, I'll give it a, a minute or so and for you to, to think of your questions. And, and if not, then we'll start to close the session. Um, Maybe if I may just add one more comment to please, uh, go ahead. answer that I talked about <laughs> to integrate converts in the, uh, in the West yes. more fully. Um, I'll just talk about 
you know, the challenges sometimes even I face. There was a long time ago, we were still in the old center mm -hmm. where we had talked about this issue of, you know, uh, preparing something to welcome anyone, uh, you know, from any background who is new. Yes. Um, you know, if you go to the church or some other places, they have people there whose task is whenever they see somebody new coming in, they will actually go and greet and welcome them, make them feel at home. Mm -hmm. And the issue was that, why don't we do something like that? Yeah. And a, a subcommittee was formed and they came up with this idea of, uh, you know, coming with a welcome kit for uh, people. And I was... Uh, happy with that and I said okay show it to me once you worked on it yeah and when I looked at it right in the beginning it says this is a project to welcome the new members of the Jamaat oh. mm -hmm. new member of Jamaat means somebody who already knows at least two people yeah for him yeah. to even sign his you know put yes. in his application to become a member right my mm -hmm. whole I Issue was somebody who is completely new, doesn't know anyone. Yes. Yes. What do you do to welcome?